today. We're doing very good. We're doing fine. Uh, so, how is the uh, world, uh, the worldwide uh, tour of RMS Medical going? Well, <clears throat> the last time we were talking about uh, what was going on in Europe for RMS, and yeah. um, <clears throat> that's what I think um, was on the agenda to talk about. Um, we're um, expanding nicely in Europe. Um, the, um, uh, we have a really fantastic new distributor in Germany uh, we're working with, and uh, <clears throat> they, they visited us. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I couldn't uh, be on a call earlier because uh, there was a conflict in the timing. They brought their entire team here from... Uh, uh, from Germany to uh, to meet with us from Nuremberg actually and uh, we have a, a lot of common interest this is a, a kind of a unique opportunity for them and for us their primary mission in Germany is to provide the medical services uh, directly to the patient and bill the insurance so the reimbursement uh, between uh, the reimbursement and uh, the services they provide. And so they're not really <clears throat> geared as a conventional distributor in the sense that they just buy product and sell it to a hospital. They actually provide the service directly to the patient, and it happens to include our system. Um, it, this is run by an ophthalmologist, uh, who cares passionately about providing patient quality uh, and uh, is very careful about the services and products he provides. Uh, and so we think this is going to be a huge opportunity um, for us uh, to work together uh, to really provide a significantly improved patient care um, as well as uh, uh, open up a lot of new markets the first thing that they did was begin using uh, our, our needle sets um, for treatment of Parkinson's disease, which is something that we don't do here in the United States. And it's, a, a, again, a huge opportunity. Um, the Parkinson's is a fairly common uh, condition, and uh, it's a, a tricky drug uh, that they're using subcutaneously. Uh, it has some major challenges <clears throat> in that it's very acidic and it's difficult to infuse and patients get reactions to it and so on. And we're pretty sophisticated in our understanding of what do you need to do to get subcutaneous tricky drugs into patients uh, without harming the patient. Um, and so um, this is something that we definitely can do and, and impact. Um, we're also doing uh, uh, several uh, trials around the world um, using our systems. Um, we've started uh, working with a pharmaceutical company to uh, introduce Russia uh, to this uh, type of therapy. Uh, <clears throat> I have some <clears throat> great personal relationships with Putin. Actually, that's not me. It's our president, but I'll take credit for it. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, you know, you, 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 you figure uh, Putin hacked the Academy Awards, too, so what the heck? <laughs> yes, exactly. Have you have you seen that picture that's going around Facebook right now? It, it's a picture of Putin without his shirt on, and, and he's holding the envelope that says movie, movie of the year. <laughs> It's just, it is hysterical. Oh. But 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 seriously, now this 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 uh, is is this kind of a concierge doctor that is doing all of this, or uh, this this sounds amazing? An ophthalmologist. Yeah, he's uh, he was trained in ophthalmology. Um, kind of an interesting character, actually. He uh, decided. Uh, that he didn't want to be a practicing ophthalmologist, and he walked away from his profession. His family thought he was crazy, <clears throat> and he just decided doing ophthalmology his whole life was not interesting to him, and he quit with nothing. And he took a job with a, uh, a pharmaceutical company. They were looking for an ophthalmologist, and they trained him in marketing and everything, 
And uh, he did that for about four years, and they were moving them all over the world. Uh, they wanted him to go to Russia. His wife said no, and uh, they were moving him to uh, Indiana somewhere. And he's thinking about this, and he said, you know what, I'm just going to do something on my own. And so he started this uh, niche company, and uh, it's quite an interesting service that he provides. Um, and he has the passion of great medical care, which absolutely coincides with our passion. As you know, <clears throat> we're trying to make the patient experience as perfect as we can get it. We're sure. trying to uh, have the most successful patient that we can have. And um, teaming with somebody who has the same passion uh, is very refreshing. Uh, you know, a lot of distributors want to do the right things, but they're basically distributors. This is uh, a gentleman who is absolutely passionate about the patient quality. Um, he's looked at all the competitive products. When we say, you know, this is what we're providing, our needles are the best, uh, he doesn't take it for granted. He pulls out a 200-power microscope, and he looks at the tips of all the needles, and he said, my God, you're right. <laughs> you know, these other needles are bent. Like, why would we use them? Uh, <clears throat> and then he looks at ours. Um, so he's really verified what it is that we do, and uh, we do get along great. He is uh, a remarkable person, and so we do expect uh, uh, and anticipate very, very good results, uh, both for the patient, and when we get good patient results, we expect that to mean good sales, good revenues. Now, Andy, is he just in Germany, or is he uh, around <clears throat> the whole EU? He um, he is in Germany, but um, he is teamed with a pharmaceutical company to provide this Parkinson's medication through major parts of Europe, if not all of Europe. Wow. And so, um, you know, we are looking at uh, how this is going to work out. Um, this looks like it's a fairly significant market. Um, our needles are ideal for it. Um, our pump, not so much. The uh, drug is inserted uh, at very weird flow rates and, and very programmed times and so on. And so we're just looking at that now to figure out whether uh, we can handle the whole system or we would just do the drug part of it, uh, the uh, needle part of it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still a very big opportunity. Uh, it was unexpected. Um, it was very serendipity that, uh, you know, he, he was talking to us and he had a need for uh, finding a better solution to get this. Uh, the drug is called apomorphine, and uh, to get it into the patient uh, subcutaneously is, is quite uh, uh, tricky, and that's, that's our specialty. We, we'll figure it out, and we have figured it out. We've provided some uh, ideas already that have uh, proven correct, and uh, so we're developing these markets, and the same is in Russia. I mean, um, <clears throat> the pharmaceutical company selected us from everybody else and uh, made us agree that if they do the clinical trial in Russia, that we will agree to make our products available in Russia, which is not a small undertaking. They have a boatload of regulatory issues, and uh, they have a bureaucracy uh, <laughs> second to none. <laughs> and uh, so we have to overcome that, and we are. We'll be doing that and working with them on that. You mean a bureaucracy bigger than ours? No, I didn't say that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, now, okay. But, you know, this but we're, we're going to reduce our, our bureaucracy by 90%. So it's we probably be will. Okay, let's get, let's get back to that drug again. Uh, are we going to see that in the foreseeable future in the United States? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, we're just starting it in Europe, and so we're understanding it. I don't know whether that drug will be able to uh, gain acceptance in the United States and how quickly. Um, but it's something to – it's certainly very interesting. They're using it quite successfully in Europe. Well, you know – it so, I mean, what, it's opportunity. What truly amazes me is, you know uh, – dealing with a lot of world-class athletes as I, I have over the years. And these guys are going to places like, you know, um, uh, France, Germany, uh, and even Russia uh, for various types of, uh, 
uh, operations and or medicines uh, for their respective problems. And it, it seems like they're light years ahead of us. Is that true? Well, in some areas, uh, that's absolutely true, uh, in my experience. Um, we have um, a lot of inertia here. Obviously, uh, we have our differences with FDA, and, uh, you know, we have um, a very uh, difficult process which uh, can inhibit uh, uh, growth in the medical area. <clears throat> uh, some countries have specialized in areas is that are very important to them, Israel, for example, in fertility. Um, so they have advanced quite well. They have a very strong um, R&D program for that. Um, and so then there's the cost issue. Obviously, uh, a lot of people are seeking treatment out of the country because it's, it is lower cost, and <clears throat> in some cases the technology is, is quite good, if not better. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. Mike, uh, questions for Andy? No, it's incredible. And uh, how about Scandinavia? How are the sales? <clears throat> Scandinavia has been using our system for some time. Um, we dominate the markets of uh, Finland and uh, Denmark, and we're pretty strong in Sweden. Um, they are the birthplace of subcutaneous immune globulin, uh, that is, Sweden is. Uh, and so Scandinavia has been using uh, subcutaneous immune globulin for the treatment of uh, immunity, uh, primary immune uh, disease um, since uh, the 90s. Uh, so they have the most experience uh, of any uh, group that uh, is using it today. And, of course, um, they could see fairly quickly the advantages uh, that we provide. Uh, our method of providing this, uh, the immunoglobulins to patients is that uh, when you put a drug in subcutaneously, uh, you're putting it into a little area under the skin, a little pocket or a depot, and uh, it's a little bit backwards to the way everything else is done in medicine. When you start a, a drug into the vein, uh, you start very slowly, <clears throat> and then you see how it goes, and then you speed it up to the rate you want. If you do that subcutaneously, it's exactly backwards, because when you start the drug, these little sacs that you're putting the drug into are empty. And so if you start slow and go fast, um, it has the effect of overfilling the little sacs and then causing pain and inflammation. And so all these little tricks with things that um, we developed with clinicians and uh, we can help with. And our pump, the Freedom System, um, provides a way of the system reacting to that buildup of drug in these uh, depots. If that happens, our system immediately and automatically corrects and reduces the flow rate. So that reduces the potential for inflammation, for pain, for swelling, redness, itching, and all the problems that you can have when you try to put these drugs uh, into the body uh, subcutaneously near the skin and so on. So the, uh, these countries, uh, Scandinavia in particular, were fully aware of those kinds of complications. They'd been doing it a long time, and so they could immediately see the benefits. We also in Scandinavia recently completed a couple of trials. Um, one was for a drug uh, that uses uh, what is called facilitated SCIG, which uh, can put in huge volumes into the body by cleaving the molecules apart and allowing these large volumes to be infused at one or two sites. And uh, the question was, uh, can this be done at home? And it's very complicated to do at home with electric pumps. And so we came up with a way of using our freedom system for this, hugely successful. Patients found 95% uh, of the time uh, they, it was very, very successful for them. And you can't get a uh, patient's uh, uh, satisfaction rate much higher than, than that. So that was very successful. We also did 
uh, a fantastically interesting study showing um, exactly, and, and, and this was in Sweden, in Scandinavia. So you can see how advanced these, uh, this, the, the, this team is over there. <clears throat> they studied uh, exactly um, what uh, length of needles you need to be successful. And uh, in part of the study, they determined how much drug volume uh, causes problems, what kind of rate uh, effects cause problems, um, how uh, patient satisfaction is related to these adverse events that occur at the site. Um, and uh, they found things that nobody had ever even thought of. We always believed that when you're putting in a needle into subcutaneous, you put it into the fat layer. And the more fat you have, um, the easier it's going to be. And this study kicked out the exact opposite effect. Everybody had always thought that for patients that have a lot of adipose tissue, that is a lot of fat tissue, it'd be very easy to do subcutaneous infusions. And the difficult patients would be those skinny little people that have no depots, no fat, and that have, or these muscle-bound people, you know, these uh, people who work out all the time and they're 100% muscle, well, they have no subcutaneous tissue there, so how are you going to get this drug into them? And it would be terrible. And what we found in this study is the exact opposite is true. The strong, lean ones and the skinny ones do fine, and it's the, the people with the belly fat that actually ran into more problems. And so this is uh, the kind of research that we do, and obviously the Scandinavians have the most experience and get the most interesting uh, results that are contrary to what is popular wisdom. Um, and that allows uh, all of us to do a better job at uh, treating patients. That was a long-winded way of saying, yeah, Scandinavia is pretty interesting to us. Yeah, well, it, sa it sounds like it. Now, I notice, okay, you've talked uh, Germany, you've talked Scandinavia. You haven't mentioned anything about the lower-tier European countries. Are they kind of coming along, or are they just kind of float along? Well, we are, uh, we've signed a new distributor for Italy. Okay. Um, we're doing <clears throat> very well in the U.K. Uh, that looks like a continually expanding market for us. Um, we are um, looking at um, other countries around the world, uh, not just uh, Europe. Um, we're beginning to uh, talk to the pharmaceutical companies for introducing their drugs in Asia. And uh, we have contacts over there. And so we're working on opening other international markets. Um, in Europe, uh, we, are, we, we have a team in Europe that is looking um, at the uh, Baltic states, for example, of former Soviet uh, countries. Uh, some of the countries are kind of hard to get into. Uh, I mean, we are talking to them. Um, Spain, Greece, they have financial issues reimbursement issues. Um, the, the need is there. <clears throat> right now, the economics are not so uh, favorable um, to add anything to their reimbursement program. Uh, France is France. Uh, they have a need. They are using it. Um, they have uh, a lot of bureaucracy, and uh, we are working with them to overcome the uh, problems that we have in uh, getting our products uh, accepted for reimbursement in France. Wow. <laughs> what amazes me is the international perspective uh, uh, all of you guys seem to give to the show, but the fact that you talk about the government bureaucracies in a lot of these countries, and you realize it's like, my goodness, it's like the government just seemed to kind of get in the way, you know, of, of a lot of the <clears throat> progress. Yes, uh I think the um, it's not that they get in the way, but reality is that you have to raise revenue to pay for all these things. It's really just follow the money, and it's true worldwide. Um, in most of the uh, countries, the uh, medical care is reimbursed either um, by the government directly or indirectly by uh, quasi-government type insurance reimbursement agencies. Um, and so the revenue uh, streams are 
uh, critical. Everybody has a constituency, so it involves politics. And so whenever you have politics and uh, economics colliding, um, you end up with uh, favorable reimbursement for one type of thing and not so favorable for another, and everybody's fighting for the resources. I think it's pretty expected. Wow. <laughs> Is there How a better system America? you can think of? <laughs> It's it's it sounds frustrating to me. I I just you know I can't even comprehend that. Mike, uh, you had a question. Well, there, there there are two issues in every country. One is um, the regulations of medical devices, and the other is the reimbursement of medical devices. We have to overcome both of those, and that's a country by country uh, situation. So for Europe, if you have a uh, a uh, CE. Uh, marking on your products, you could sell it in any country. So the regulatory part can be covered, but then you still need to get the reimbursement part. And so you have to get everything lined up before you can be successful in any country. That's what the challenge is, and that is a country-by-country -country basis. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's work. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like a mic uh, question uh, for Andy. Well, it's a unique, very unique product, of course. And how about Latin America? What's happening there? <clears throat> we have, uh, we know that they're beginning to move into Latin America. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, a third tier priority. Uh, we're looking first to deploy into Europe. Um, there is uh, uh, definite interest in Latin America. Um, we need to identify uh, appropriate distribution channels and partners. Uh, and we're in the process of doing that as well. Uh, there are some additional challenges in Latin America. Their reimbursement systems are also under great duress right now. Some of the countries are uh, quite difficult to work with. We had started, for example, in Brazil, and uh, you know the Brazil um, uh, bureau bureaucracy is, is, is pretty challenging. Uh, we have our rescue vac in Brazil. We have distribution channels there, uh, but bringing in uh, the infusion system um, was a whole different level that uh, that we're working on. We've, we're talking to people in Argentina um, and uh, Mexico. Uh, so those are the highlights of our South American strategy for the moment. But um, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, have it on our list. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, for you, the reimbursement part is probably uh, uh, the most important. And, you know, you hear a lot of horror stories about Brazil and even some in Argentina as far as paying bills, you know, and obviously you need to get paid. Well, it's, um, it's a challenge. Uh, as you may know, uh, some of these countries, um, they run 180 days behind payments. Uh, between the service and, and before they can get paid. <clears throat> and so the carrying charges are enormous, and so you have to build all of this into the, your uh, pricing structure. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of that does create speed bumps before you can be successful in that market. <laughs> it's not just us. I mean, it's not like yeah. our equipment. Like, it's the whole process. Sure. The biggest cost is the drug. The drug is thousands of dollars per dose. We're just a little tail on the end of that. So once you figure out how do you get reimbursed for getting a drug administered into the patient, uh, that's the big challenge. And that's where an awful lot of money is in the float. And that's where it takes a, um, a lot how of How much is the immune globulin in America? It runs about uh, anywhere between 1200 and $2,000 per dose. Uh, typically, uh, the dose is done weekly. Wow. That's expensive. It's, it's wow. generally about uh, 100 uh, bucks a gram, and your typical dose is anywhere, uh, you know, that's, uh, it, it was 100 to 140 dollars a gram, depending on which drug it is, and your dose is about 10 grams at a time. Wow. Oh, my God. Average. I mean, for an adult, normal adult. So it's in that range, I think. I'm not an expert on the pricing of this stuff. But, you know, the cost of the uh, infusion equipment 
is uh, only a few percent added to the cost of the drug. So the drug is what's going to drive everything. Uh, it's reimbursement on the drug side. If you don't have the drug reimbursement, you can't afford anything. You can't, so the equipment doesn't matter. Um, once you decide you're going to pay for the drug, then you want to get that drug in uh, with as least problems and as most efficacy as possible because the drug is so damn expensive. You certainly don't want to waste it, and you certainly don't want it uh, to end up where it's causing patient complications instead of doing the job it needs to do. So that's where the benefit of the equipment against the cost of the entire therapy is uh, so much in our favor. Uh, having, uh, you know, an effective way of getting this very costly drug into the patients is paramount. And uh, we provide that type of uh, support uh, to ensure that the uh, patient gets the great results uh, for this drug. Wow, phenomenal, Andy. Uh, uh, Andy Seelfon, the uh, president and CEO at RMS Medical Products, and uh, pretty easy website, too, rmsmedicalproducts.com. And uh, R-E-P-R is the symbol. Oh, and R-E-P-R, correct, is the stock symbol as well. So, uh, Andy, uh, boy, uh, phenomenal information as always. And uh, uh, we will uh, be talking with you down the line. And, hey, keep it going. And you're, it sounds like the Swedish and, and the Germans are uh, light years ahead of everybody. So it's congratulations to you on that. Thank you. All Have right. A great day. Okay. Andy Seelfon, who is uh, president and CEO of RMS Medical. And before Andy, Tim Connolly, who's the uh, oil expert, Mr. Mike King. Unbelievable. And Mike is already, to show you how efficient he is, already got all those charts uh, that uh, Tim Conley was talking about, about the looking ahead five years in the oil industry. Wow, great, great to have these resources, isn't it? Wow. And don't forget, PrincetonResearch.com. That research letter comes out every Sunday. Just go to the website, sign up, and it's yours. Money Info, every Tuesday right here on WPSL, Port St. Lucie, WPSL.com, Webcaster to the World, and WPSL-TV on YouTube.